Hello, my name is Ayana Flemings and I'm American. And I love traveling and visiting different countries and learning about different cultures. And recently I've learned about Azerbaijan. It's a very interesting, controversial place. Have you ever heard of Azerbaijan? Do you know anything about Azerbaijan? Have you ever thought of visiting Azerbaijan? Well, let's see. What do you know about Azerbaijan? Azerbaijan? Nothing. What do you know about Azerbaijan? Absolutely nothing. <laughs> do you know what it is? No, sir, I don't. Azerbaijan. Uh, I know it's... Wow. Uh, what do you know about Azerbaijan? Who? Huh? You know, I read about it all the time. I, I, I know what it is, and it's just... Um, is it a country? No, no. Apparently, not too many people know anything about Azerbaijan. But if someone from Azerbaijan were to invite you to their country, would you take their word for it and go? Well, in this film, we found many people that are not from Azerbaijan, but have been there many times. And they're going to tell you why you should go. And you can take their word for it. This is Kafka's Azerbaijan, and it's a unique phenomenon in the world. I felt like I was either in Vienna or one of those Central European cities. It's a very interesting set of contrasts. In general, it, it, East meets West in Azerbaijan. I was actually surprised when I came to Baku about this flair of of uh, 1,001 nights. The best thing in Azeri is once they are friend, they are friend forever. It's kind of orderly chaos or chaotic order. Ten year back, first time I landed in Baku, we took a cab and from the airport to till downtown, total jungle. It was total dark and I was so scared. I said, what is going on? I mean, where we are going? Are, is this guy taking us in the right place? Are we going in some city or what is this? But today, if you look at Baku, thank to your president and his son, really great. I mean, now if I got down at the midnight over there, I could see I'm really in a Western world. I was actually surprised when I came to Baku about this flair of, of uh, 1001 nights. And I really sort of felt the remnants, the, the, the aura of a bustling oriental city, especially in the, in the old city um, with the gates, with the wall, with the, the still remaining old houses. One cannot go up to Maiden Tower, it's so near to the office. And there's that lovely district right between the Maiden Tower and the Hammams there where they had the uh, beautiful wooden walkways. I like that district very much. I did uh, climb up on Maiden Tower a few times and uh, I know the story why it's called Maiden Tower of the princess who jumped down into the sea which then still was at the bottom to save her honor, I think. It's a very impressive structure. And uh, I would often walk the streets uh, but typically, it depends on what hotel I stayed in. I would walk from either from my hotel, if I was within a walking distance, or alternatively at lunchtime. I would walk around if it wasn't too terribly hot. And I always found it charming. Of course, each Asia has beautiful, charming, has atmosphere. It's a heritage from the past centuries and goes back pretty far. There are ba basically three different Baku as I see. One is Baku of the 19, end of 19th century, the first oil boom. Well, I'm talking about downtown, Icherisher, Fantan Square, and that part of the city, which reflects the huge wealth of those days. And in a lot of architecture with good taste and style, pieces of art. Old 19th century Baku is, I mean, the first time I was in downtown Baku, Fantan Square, I felt like I was either in Vienna or one of those Central European cities. What I like about Baku regards, amongst many things, its architecture. 
because it is so varied from place to place. Then you have the Soviet time, Baku. Then I'm talking about 800 kilometers and then the microrayons in the north, right? With all these ugly buildings. They are very little traces of these box-like buildings that you see in other countries of the former Soviet Union. Then the third Baku is the new oil boom Baku. That's what you see, the new roads, new high-rises. It's not like you go to a Nordic countries where everything is spec and span and everything has to be very orderly. It's kind of orderly chaos or chaotic order. There's order in spite of all the uh, non-monotonous design of buildings, the way how goods are displayed. Baku architecture is something, a mixture of East and West. You see the best of Europe, also the best of Asia, and it's combined in this culture and this environment and atmosphere in the food, in the architecture, and the characters. It's a very interesting set of contrasts. In general, East meets West in Azerbaijan. For me, it's definitely Western. I mean, Western, Western has a big scope of different cultures anyways, but uh, I would definitely put Azerbaijan into the West. But I would say that in general, that the older generation has more Eastern feeling to them and the younger generation has more Western. The most reasonable explanation, I think, is media exposure. The fact that young people have access to much more Western media than the older generation. Now, if you go to Ryons, for example, if you go to Sheki, if you go to Masalda, you will tend to think that this is an Eastern culture, an Eastern country. But if you sort of in downtown Baku, that, that has not only Eastern, but more uh, Western elements in it. You immediately notice the huge difference between the oil-dominated capital and the oil fields around it and all the bustling and industry and, and activity around oil. And then as soon as you move away from it, Azerbaijan turns into a completely different country, very quiet, very very laid back, very still very natural. You seem, I had the feeling that outside Baku people live very close to nature, uh, live a simple life, much simpler than in Baku. Uh, thus far I've been to two regions of the country. Uh, what I like both about Shamakha and Lankaran is how very different they are from uh, Baku. And with that uh, the climate's different, obviously the air is better on the one side, uh, people more approachable, just as they are in most countries in uh, rural areas versus urban areas, uh, but very pleasant. Both are different, beautiful, actually, both were. The people you see enjoying life actually seem to be outside this whole frenzy about making money and spending money. You see all these people in really, really big, expensive cars, very well dressed and having this sort of empty, stressed out look, and then you see people who apparently don't have a lot of money or have a lot less money who sit somewhere in the park and play a game of cards or or chess and seem absolutely relaxed and happy with themselves and the world so I think this is really a, a bit of a rift in the national character maybe or in the national fabric you have this frenzy for for money which actually the, the people don't need they are they could be could be perfectly satisfied without it it's my impression that 